Okay. Well, thanks, Jesper. Um, okay, so yeah, this is um, work on uh, doing batch secure two-party computation um, that is non-interactive, which means there's two messages. And it's joint work with uh, Mike Rasoek. Um, so I don't actually know why I made this slide. This is secure two-party computation. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, but we are interested in secure two-party computation where there's only um, two messages uh, exchanged. You know, the one party sends a message, the second party responds, and then the first party essentially can compute the output from that. Okay, so that's sort of our, uh, this is the sort of protocol we are interested in. Um, and, you know, there's motivations for that um, if you are computing uh, or communicating over a high latency network, you rather to minimize the number of round trips that you have to do. And also, there may be uh, interesting, somewhat unconventional ways you, m you may want to communicate, such as uh, through email or a bulletin board. Uh, so these are sort of scenarios where the both, both parties don't have to be necessarily be online at the same time. One party can post their first message, the second party can come online uh, later on and sort of uh, post the, the second message and then, then sort of uh, you, you, get the, you get the output, the, the first party gets the output. So you, you, don't, you don't have to do this many, many times. So you're minimizing how, how much you have to do this, uh, you know, whether it's an attachment to an email or a bulletin board and so on. So there's motivations for, for doing that. Um, and uh, there's lots of work that actually, you know, studies this, uh, theoretical constructions and, um, um, and so on, but there's also we actually know that uh, you can also achieve this with sort of very good concrete efficiency that is uh, fairly com comparable with sort of the best secure two-party computation protocols we know. Well, the best two-party computations we know kind of keeps changing, right? <laughs> but uh, as you saw in the last talk, but sort of very, very close, right, uh, in terms of sort of the efficiency you get, so which is good. So. Um, <coughs> If you can get the best, minimize around complexity and, and sort of have very good mm, concrete efficiency, so we, we would do it. Okay. Uh, what, what is, uh, so another aspect to secure two-party computation uh, is sort of when you want to run many different instances of secure two-party computation using different inputs. So that's sometimes called batch secure computation. Uh, and <coughs> here the goals are to um, either get better amortized efficiency so for example, the, the, the work, uh, the mm, se several recent work show that you can get a log n factor of improvement, overall improvement in everything, communication, computation, and so on, um, uh, where n is the number of executions that you, you wanna have. And concretely, this, this even works out better if you've uh, been to some of the talks um, in the previous days. So it's really good concrete gains when you are running many instances of secure computation. And uh, it also has a nice feature that you can do bulk of the computation in an offline phase where you don't know the inputs to the computation. And then in an online phase, you, ha you have a very fast on online phase that is sort of not proportional to the size of the computation or the circuit you want to compute. Okay. So uh, we also know how to do this, but sort of the solutions we know are require multiple rounds, so, uh, so they are not non-interactive, so this stuff like that. So what we were hoping for in this work was that can we get the best of both worlds? You wanna do many secure uh, executions of uh, secure two-party computation um, using different inputs, but we really wanna make sure that we actually only have two messages sent and received, and we get the same concrete sort of gains that we have for batch execution and non-interactive to PC. Uh, so that's sort of the goal here. Right? We wanna get the best of both worlds. And I wanted to point out is that you don't actually have to run all those instances at the same time. You may not have the inputs for them ready. Uh, so it, it, uh, and, that, and that's fine. So for example, you, if, if you're thinking of it in an um, online offline phase, you can sort of do the offline phase uh, at one point, and, but then you want all the online phases to be uh, two, two messages whenever you have the inputs for them ready. If you have some of the inputs ready, you can run on those and then Again, when you have some of the other inputs, again, each time you have inputs ready, you just wanna have to exchange two messages. Okay, so that's sort of the goal um, here. Okay, so uh, 
all our approaches, of course, uh, are going to be based on garbled circuits. This is a very quick overview, as uh, um, just to familiarize you with the notation. Here we're going to use uh, we have, we're going to have a circuit C that represents our function. We're going to have a garbling algorithm that takes a seed and the description of the circuit and gives us a garbled circuit. And we are going to use the same C to encode inputs or garbled inputs. Garbled inputs. So this is essentially on the right, and on your right hand side is the semi-honest security party garbled circuits, where there's a garbler who sends a garbled circuit and the garbled inputs to the evaluator, uh, and the evaluator also learns its own garbled inputs using oblivious transfer, and then evaluates the garbled circuit on the garbled inputs to learn the output. It's very high level, we don't have to get into the, a lot of details. What we know, this is, this is semi-honest secure, and it is actually can be, uh, is, is already a two-message secure two-party computation. The, the way to think of it is that, you know, in the, obli in the oblivious transfer, the evaluator first sends the first message of the oblivious transfer, the, the garbler responds with the second message of the ob oblivious transfer along with the garbled circuit, um, and it's garbled inputs. And so we have a two-message semi-honest um, two PCs, okay? Uh, so, um, and, and there are various ways to make this non-interactive, of course, but since we sort of want a concretely efficient protocol, we sort of uh, are going to look at the cut and choose approach, okay? So let's quickly, again, review the cut and choose approach. So here you have the garbler send many, gar multiple garbler circuits. The evaluator will ask the garbler to open uh, a subset of these garbled circuits, uh, and then it it has a guarantee that sort of the re in the remaining garbled circuits, the majority are correct. So you can, you can evaluate those and then recover the output, okay? So that's the general approach. And, um, and, and of course, the, as, as Xiao mentioned, there is the, this better approach that is sort of has different names, forge and lose, input recovery, cheating recovery. But essentially, um, um, the idea is that um, you, you can, you can improve the efficiency by sending less circuits because you only require the guarantee that at, 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 le at least one, one of the evaluated garbled circuits is correct, as opposed to the majority of them being correct, okay? And so essentially, how do you achieve that? By, this is by opening some of the circuits, evaluating the rem remainder, and then um, having a, so a separate process that um, says if the evaluator received two different outputs, it can actually, if, it, if and if it can prove that it received two different outputs, it will learn the garbler's input, right? Which allows the, gar, uh, the evaluator to actually compute the output on its own, and that's fine. So that's the cheating recovery mechanism. But uh, so and and but that cheating recovery mechanism is going to be very sort of much more efficient than the original computation. It's as a, its size is not dependent on the original size of the, the bigger circuit. Okay, so now. We are sort of we are interested in in non two message, uh, non interactive secure two party computation, uh, and sort of uh, you can see that a lot of things that you have to do. It's not obvious how to do this in, in, in with just two messages. For example, this uh, of the previous uh, a lot of the techniques you sort of have a separate two PC just for the cheating recovery, right? So you have to do the original two PC and the cheating recovery two PC. So there's sort of multiple rounds of interaction to do all of this. Okay. So before sort of saying, um, going to the non-interactive 2PC protocols, let me say if so we're going to use a primitive that is sort of very useful to us. It's called homomorphic commitments. Uh, so these are commitments that you're all familiar with, with the hiding and binding properties, but we also want it to have a homomorphic property. Uh, and it's sort of somewhat a special homomorphic property uh, that says, uh, you know, if I commit to two values A and B, I can, of course, open it to A x or B or A plus B, whatever my homomorphic operation is. Uh, but also that the opening itself, the, the commitment to the the, uh, the the opening itself is sort of a homomorphic operation under the commitments, the individual the commitments. Okay, so that's that's the extra property that you will see become becomes useful as we we're going to try to do design our protocol. But essentially, all the uh, sort of uh, very nice techniques we have now for doing homomorphic commitments have this sort of property. Okay, uh, so Patterson commitments is if you, if you, you you're willing to use public key operations, Patterson commitments are fairly communication efficient. So you have very small 
uh, commitment sizes. There is uh, OT-based uh, commitments uh, that were used in uh, work of Linda Riva for input consistency, uh, so which means we can, we can use a lot of symmetric key operations. And then there is very interesting work that is sort of, uh, is actually, um, be has better uh, rates in terms of how much message you can commit to compared to the size of the commitments that uses, uh, com uses oblivious transfer and coding techniques. Um, and there's sort of pros and cons to each approach. As, as you sort of uh, note, like the operation commitment has public key operations, the other two can be dominated by symmetric key operations which are faster. Uh, the sort of Linda Riva solution has the advantage that it's, it can be made non-interactive or two message without sort of anything fancy. It's sort of, it only uses OT. Uh, uh, the code based approaches are, have much better rates, uh, but sort of they have this interactive setup, which you can get rid of if you are use random Oracle, uh, or if you are sort of in an offline online phase where the offline phase is where you do the interactive setup. But sort of otherwise, it's, uh, it's at least it was not obvious to us how to make it non-interactive. So it, it all depends sort of on, on what you want to do. But for us, it doesn't matter. All our protocols are kind of to use uh, this sort of homomorphic commitment in an in abstract way. As long as the, the, the opening is sort of has this homomorphic uh, um, property as well. Okay, so uh, let me start by uh, the single execution setting. And this sort of uh, our starting point is the Afshar et al's uh, protocol, um, and which we sort of generalize a little bit to use uh, homomorphic commitments in an abstract way, and that allows us uh, to do uh, more interesting things with it, okay? So what is the idea? So the garbler will garble multiple circuits. This is for the cut and choose. Uh, it will send all the garbled circuits to the evaluator. It will also encrypt its garbled inputs for those circuits using some uh, KI, right? So we have GCIs, and the garbled inputs included with KI. Then what do we do for evaluator's input? Uh, you know, for every input of the evaluator, uh, there, will be, um, well, there will be OTs, right? Uh, and then the evaluator will learn the corresponding garbled input. So this is, again, two messages. Uh, for the cut and choose, we will do another OT where the evaluator will say whether I want to open or uh, evaluate this circuit. And depending on the choice of the bit, it either learns the seed that was used to garble the circuit or it learns the key that was used to encrypt the garbled inputs. Um, um, so it can actually learn the garbled inputs of the garbler and evaluate the circuit. And uh, so, so, so far, we are all two messages. These OTs we can run in parallel. So, um, so we, we are a two message protocol. Uh, how do we have the garbler send its uh, garbled inputs? Uh, in particular, how do we do the input consistency in a non-interactive way? So this is somewhat sort of a little bit different from the Afshar et al. Uh, and so we, you're going to use the homomorphic commitment. So if you remember, sort of the garbler has to commit to, uh, will commit to the two labels corresponding to uh, 0 and 1 for each input wire. Let's assume there's just one bit of input, right? It's, they are randomly permuted using a permutation bit. Uh, this is sort of a standard technique. Okay, so what the garbler is going to do is going to um, commit to those uh, labels in using a standard commitment, but it's also going to homomorphically commit to the permutation uh, uh, bit, and of course, uh, separately also co co homomorphically commit to its input. So this is just done once. This is done per circuit. Okay, those are done per circuit. Okay. Uh, so, um, and this is sort of a Linda Riva technique for, for doing input consistency check, okay? But we we're just doing, using it in a non-interactive scenario. So what happens now, when if, if a circuit is chosen to be opened, of course, the, the, the evaluator learns the permutation bits and check that, uh, and all the keys and can check that things were done correctly. But if uh, the circuit is being evaluated, uh, there will be, uh, what, what will be revealed to the evaluator is the opening of the XOR of the input and the permutation bit, okay? So, and so this essentially takes care of the input consistency check because we know that it, the, the input can, this input is fixed across all the different circuits. So really you cannot use different inputs or change the inputs, right? As long as the permutation bit is correct for one of the circuits, then we are using that input that we are committed to, okay? So that's how we, you, we take care of the input consistency. Again, non-interactively. It all happens through the same circuit OT you can think of. Um, in fact, sort of the, the better way to think about it is that you will encrypt this sort of decommitment to the XOR 
um, when you in, along with the garble input, so in that key ki. So that's sort of the better way to think about. It. Okay, how do we take care of the cheating recovery? Uh, so here uh, again, let's assume there is one output wire, and the garbler will homomorphically commit to the two output output wire for zero and output output label for zero and output label for one. Uh, it will uh, it will also um, generate two random values. Okay, uh, these are the same for all circuits that are XORed. When they are XORed, they give you the actual input. Okay. So these are, um, or, or other homomorphic operations. I'm just using XOR as, a, as our homomorphic operation here. So, and to show that this is the case, it will actually open the XOR of these three um, commitments. And this is, this is done. This, these are fixed commitments across all circuits. Uh, so what happens now? Uh, then uh, for circuits that are opened, of course, the, the, the value theory learns both labels, okay? But for circuits that are evaluated, the, the garbler will be revealing the XOR of the output label and the corresponding random value, okay? And now what happens, uh, how do we do cheating recovery? Now imagine that evaluator learns two different output labels, then it will learn both W0 and W1, which it allows it to recover the input X, okay? And, uh, but if it's not, there's no cheating, it, uh, the evaluator will only learn one of the labels, therefore it can only, uh, it cannot recover X. Okay, so that's sort of, again, now everything is happening through those two OTs, so this is a two-message protocol. Yeah, so that's, that's sort of the single execution protocol using homomorphic commitments in a very abstract way, okay? All right, so how do we do batch execution? Uh, let me remind you what sort of these batch execution techniques are. Now we are doing many executions. We have many different inputs. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna generate a large number of garbled circuits. We're gonna have uh, multiple buckets, each bucket represents a single execution with a, a different input. Okay, we're gonna uh, assign each garbled circuit randomly uh, to one of these buckets, and we're gonna sort of assume that the last bucket here is gonna be this bucket where we open the circuit. Okay, so this is sort of better abstraction for our, um, for our non-interactive version. Okay, so that's how we, we're gonna do things. So the evaluator will be choosing which circuits to go where randomly, right? And the garbler puts them there, and each bucket will correspond to one execution. So this sort of allows, because we are doing it in, in a batch setting, this allows us to have a, a log n factor less garbled circuits generated for the n executions that we wanna have. Okay, so that's sort of the idea. Uh, so we wanna make this sort of approach uh, and then you sort of uh, each of these separate buckets, you can think of it, you would repeat what we, we were talking about before, right? So they are just, each of them are a single uh, Katanji who's 2PC. So how do we do this in an interactive way? I wanna just list the sort of, what are some of the challenges? So, so now instead of sort of obliviously either evaluating or opening a circuit, you sort of have to obliviously assign these circuits to all these buckets. So it's a little bit different, not too hard, but you have to sort of change things in this way to, to make it an oblivious assignment to these buckets. But sort of uh, a little bit harder is you, now the garbler has to send garbled inputs for each circuit, right? But actually it doesn't know yet uh, which input will is correspond to uh, which garbled circuit. It doesn't know the assignments of the garbled circuits to buckets, which would determine which input you actually have to garble, right? Because everything is happening in the same two rounds, right? It's not like it first finds out what the buckets are, and then can garble the inputs, those inputs for that circuit. So it sort of has to do it without knowing. And similar things for input consistency, right? It has to sort of, we want it to prove that it's using the same input for the garble circuits for one bucket, but it doesn't know a priori which circuits are gonna be in the same bucket, so to do that proof for. And again, for cheating recovery, it doesn't know again is it which two different uh, outputs of which two circuits, if they are different, it should, it should learn the actual input, recover the actual input from. So, so we, we wanna make all of these interactive, uh, not interactive. So how do we do this? Um, so sort of, uh, sort of the first naive solution that comes to mind is, you know, let's just have the garbler generate the garbled inputs for all possible inputs, right, of all the executions, and also generate input consistency gadgets and perhaps uh, output recovery gadgets, everything for all the possibilities, right? And then for every circuit, do a one out of n sort of OT that mm, where the receiver 
chooses to learn the garbled inputs for one of these sort of buckets, right? Uh, the receiver decides what to do that. So of course this is already inefficient because sort of you, you have to do n squared communication where the number of executions is n and large, so that's not good. But, but it's actually, it's not clear even then how to make it work because the possibilities are not just n, right? You, if you think about it, for output recovery, for example, the possibilities are all the circuits that are going to go to the same bucket, right? So it's not more than n possibilities, right? You don't know which circuits are going to go to your bucket, so you have to do the output recovery with those, those circuits. So, so it's not completely obvious even this sort of how to make this one out of n uh, per circuit work. But our hope is to, not, to avoid this, to really get sort of the, do much better than this. So what is our idea? So our main building is sort of, uh, I'm going to just sort of give you an idea of uh, the technique. So the main ingredient is this protocol called the Oblivious uh, Switching Network. Uh, what does switching, uh, this Oblivious Switching Network do? Uh, so we have our uh, receiver on, on the right-hand side, and his input to this sort of two-party protocol is uh, a, a permutation, okay? Um, and, uh, and then we have uh, our sender here, uh, and his input to the protocol are two input vectors. Uh, one are sort of the input wires here to this box, uh, and then the second input vector is, are sort of these paddings that I'm denoting by R1 through R5. They don't have to be random. Could be any input that the sender chooses, okay? And what is the output that the receiver receives? It's sort of the permuted versions of the XIs XORed by the paddings, where the paddings are not permuted. Right, in the same order that this, uh, they were originally uh, arranged by the um, sender. Okay, so that's our idea. So, but the way they are permuted is decided by the receiver. So, uh, so you can think of it as that, so the inputs to the switching networks uh, are sort of the, all the garbled circuits. Each wire corresponds to a single wire garbled circuit in this batch cut and choose. And sort of the outputs are those, uh, those, uh, those garbled circuits reordered in the way they are supposed to be located in, in the buckets. Uh, okay, uh, and, so, and that's what's decided by, uh, by, the val uh, by the receiver here, okay? So we can do this sort of, we've, we've shown that you can do this uh, protocol using uh, sort of n log n OTs where n is sort of the, the input size by using a switching network and then again because you can run all the OTs in parallel, this is, this is a two message protocol, okay? Uh, so let's say we have such a protocol. Um, then what can you do? So let me give you, uh, so, so then things start becoming easy, okay? So how do we do the cut and choose? How do we assign circuits to buckets, right? Uh, so what, for example, how do we, uh, how do we open um, the, garb the garbled circuits obliviously without, uh, without the evaluator knowing? So for example, what, what, the, what the garbler, what we can do is we can have the, the garbler feed the seeds, the openings for all the garbled circuits as, in, as, as the inputs to the, um, the switching network. And for the paddings, it will use random paddings for the circuits, for the executions that are going to be evaluated and zero for the circuit that is, uh, circuits that are going, going to be open. Now as a result, uh, for only the circuit that is going to be, uh, circuits that are going to be opened, uh, the evaluator actually learns the seed, the opening. For everything else, it just gets something random. Okay, so this is how the sort of the switching network is deciding for us for what, what is being opened, what is being evaluated, okay? Oh. And similarly, um, if, you, if you remember the, the input consistency check that I was talking about, is we, were, we had so homomorphic commitments for every input, so for every execution, and we had homomorphic commitment for every permutation bit for every garbled circuit. So this is xj and si, right? So how do we open these? Because we don't know which one, which XOR pair we have to open a priori. So what we're going to do is actually f send these decommitments uh, through the switching network, okay? So you can see that the paddings are going to be the decommitments to the inputs, right? So they are going to be, and for the open circuits, there's going to be sort of a zero, right? Because we, we, don't, we, don't, o we don't open the decommitments for the open circuits. And then sort of the, the, the actual inputs to the switching network are going to be the decommitments for the permutation bits. And they, they go through the switching network, and what you get is sort of for the, the, the circuits that are being evaluated, you open the, the commitment to uh, the right input XOR with the right permutation bit. 
Okay, so, so again, the decommitments are being permuted in the switching network and you get the right decommitment and the evaluator then opens that XOR. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna, because I don't have much time, sort of you have to do this and there's sort of for every single thing that we, we need to do for uh, garbled, sending garbled inputs for both the garbler and evaluator, the cheating recovery, sort of a similar sort of ideas uh, takes place so if you, you, you're careful about how, how you do it. So every, all is essentially, uh, the idea is sending these decommitments in the switching network and they get homomorphically um, um, so, so permuted and then sort of you get the homomorphic decommitment of what you really are supposed to learn, okay? So I'm gonna skip then uh, the rest of these. So there's some subtle piece in, in various ones but I don't have time uh, to go over them. So what is this? this is sort of a table that um, shows some, um, the summary of results. I only talked about sort of the standard uh, batch execution where you, you have all the inputs sort of uh, at once and, you're, and you're, you're not assuming a random oracle model, but essentially, so the number of garbled circuits that you have to send, the garbled circuits are not being sent through the switching network, so you don't, they, don't, uh, they don't have the sort of the expense of the switching network, it's not, uh, they, they, they don't have to go through that complexity. What you're sending through the switching network are essentially the commitments that are all corresponding to the inputs and the outputs. So, so this is the only thing that will be n, O of n, that will not have the log n uh, improvement factor. Uh, and, um, um, and, but everything else is sort of has a log n improvement factor. And you can actually avoid that if you use random oracles or you are in the uh, online offline setting where you're online. Um, so, so both of those can be avoided if in these other two cases. But this is sort of the summary of the, the complexities. Um, so let me finish with a bunch of uh, open questions. Things that can improve uh, sort of this approach are one is if you have OT extensions that are only require two messages. All the so sort of because we don't have such OT extensions, we we cannot use OT extension actually to in this sort of to achieve get non-interactive protocols. So that would be very interesting. Um, the oblivious switching network protocol is requires uh, n log n OTs. Okay, so it would be nice to be have sort of this non-interactive or uh, oblivious switching network, or we should say not switching network, oblivious sort of permutation with this sort of padding property that we want. We want it to be non-interactive, uh, but and have O of n complexity. There is O of uh, you can easily, for example, do get O of n complexity with additively homomorphic encryption, but it actually requires three messages. So it's not non-interactive. So it would be nice to sort of do that somewhat efficiently. And then um, um, I mentioned um, a bunch of other questions that I also mentioned that would be nice to get sort of, and in this may be already sort of, I have no idea, sort of, uh, but if you can get this sort of OT-based homomorphic commitments that are non-interactive and have constant rates uh, without assuming a random oracle, I think that would also be uh, um, interesting. Uh, addition that will improve efficiencies. Okay, with that, I'll finish.